So for four weeks now, we've had this enormous throne here on our platform. And, and its intention is to serve as some sort of a picture, some sort of a, a, a visual of an important truth about our soul. And it's this, at the center of your heart as a human being, the, that grand central station of all that you are, at the center of the human heart is a throne upon which somebody or something sits and reigns over your life. And for four weeks now, we've been, uh, we've been exploring what does that mean? What does that look like? And throughout the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at a list of arenas of life that if we're not careful, they can assume a place on the throne. They can become our boss. They can set the agenda for our life. They can determine our priorities if we're not careful. And we may call ourselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, but there's a host of other things that seem to rule our life. Sometimes our job and career. Sometimes it's our pursuit of wealth and money. Sometimes it's just the lifestyle that we insist for ourselves, comfort and convenience. Sometimes it's our family and our children and our marriage that seems to call all the shots. And a host of other things. And we've been touching on most all of these the last couple of weeks. The one that I have not been talking about at all is this one. Politics and government and culture. And that's, that's what we're going to explore today. And somebody says, uh-oh. <laughs> Why this one? Why this one? Well, a couple of reasons is because we're two months away from a, a national election. We're, in, we're immersed in the throes of a contentious and vitriolic and divisive election. I don't know if you've noticed. <laughs> and this election, like all elections, it has enormous implications for our nation. The nation that we as Christians live in. It certainly has enormous implications for Christ followers and for the church. We have two predominant parties that agree on absolutely nothing except this one thing. Both of them are framing it the exact same way. That this election is about a fight for democracy and the future of our nation. Sounds pretty serious, doesn't it? So, why speak on this issue? Why not just ignore it? Well, here's what I believe, that when the church chooses to ignore these important situations of real life, Christians are ill-equipped to think and act like Christ followers. And we have seen that in spades over the last 10, 15 years. When Christians behave poorly in these very crucial cultural crossroads, which is what an election represents, among other things, but an election certainly. The noble purpose of the church, the entire reason why we're here on this earth, it can be compromised. You, you, you do know that the church has a purpose, right? You, you do know there's a reason why we as Christians are on this earth. But do you know that purpose? I've been reading a very helpful book on this whole discussion. And the author, Andy Stanley, says this. We're, we're not here to save America. We're here to save Americans. People that matter. The role of the church was to be a witness for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sometimes, a lot of times, the way we behave as Christians when it comes to our politics is we compromise this mission and this noble purpose of the church. We turn more people away than we attract. So, 
So people say, well, Paul, why don't you just avoid the topic entirely? I mean, people, people will become upset. People will be offended. People will leave the church. People will feel unwelcome. People will spread rumors about our church. Relax. <laughs> Relax. It's not that kind of a message. This message is not what you think it's going to be. And it's not what some of you would like it to be. <laughs> this message is not about Republicans or Democrats. It's not about Trump or Harris. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and his lordship in our life. And I want to provide some perspective on how the lordship of Christ influences how we think and how we behave when it comes to politics. Does that make sense? I'm talking about the lordship of Christ. We've been talking about this for four weeks now. We're in our fifth week of talking about this. So, you know, I'm not just bringing this up. We've been talking about this. All we're doing today is looking, how, looking at how does our politics fit up under the reign of Christ in our life? Because I think most Christians have never considered that. For some reason, our politics are ours. It's off limits to Christ. Most Christians struggle with integrating their faith into their politics. To see issues facing our lives and our nation. To see issues from a biblical or spiritual perspective. Rather than through the preferred parties, identities, ideologies, and agendas. Does that make sense? Most Christians, I've been a pastor for 40 years. I've had a lot of conversations with people. I can verify this to be true. Most Christians have never seriously and objectively submitted their political beliefs to the lordship of Christ in their life. They've never diligently examined their preferred party's platform or their candidate's positions to the truth of the Bible or to the wisdom of God. And it's created a lot of problems. So, if, if you've been here the last five weeks, we've been looking at some passages of scripture. And before we get to them, when a Christian refuses to obey God's word because it conflicts with his political preferences, he has forced Jesus off the throne of his heart and he's placed his politics, his party, his preferred candidate in that seat and bowed down to their authority over his life. Did you get that? When I don't submit my politics to my savior, then what I'm saying is my party, its platform, my favorite candidate, it gets to sit on the throne and I'll submit my life to them, to that. And that doesn't reflect a heart that's sincerely submitted to Jesus Christ. So here's, here's the three passages of scripture we've been looking at for the last five weeks as sort of the basis of our understanding of, uh, of the topic of lordship. Folks, I, we, could, we could back the truck up. I could unload 33 verses on lordship. Here's the three we've been looking at. Peter writes, in your hearts, down here in the core of your being, I want you to set apart, that's what this word means, to revere to make sort of a devoted resolution that I'm going to let Jesus, the one who has been anointed by God to be king, I'm going to let him be the boss of me. 
Jesus said it this way, seek first, go looking for, pursue the kingdom of God, the rule of God in your life, and to do your life under his rule in keeping with his righteousness, the way that God would prefer that we do things. And then Paul writes to the early early church, he says, I don't care if if you're eating or drinking, like the the most simplest um, activities of life, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. This word glory means heavy or weighty. Do whatever you do in a way that reflects the weight of influence that God carries in your life, particularly if you recognize him as your king. So whatever you do, whatever you watch on television, however you drive your car, the way that you reconcile relationships with people who've ticked you off, and guess what else? Whatever includes your vote, your politics, and how you approach all of that. Whatever you do, do it in a way that brings glory to God. You recognize those verses, right? So I want to show you how it works. Like how it works in really practical ways. In your heart, revere Christ as Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. So in your job or your career, the pursuits of your profession, we are to do it in a way that reflects that Christ is the Lord of our life. So if our job or our career sends us in a direction that's inconsistent with Christ being the ruler of our life, then we might have to look at how we do our job, or we might have to look at doing a different job if we're going to be consistent with our faith. When you go into the office, when you go into your work, when you pursue your career, you, your first and highest priority is to go, how does this help me to accomplish the rule of Christ in my life? How do I do my job? How do I treat my coworkers? How do I convince uh, my, uh, my vendors to buy my product? How do I convince a, a client to take the sale? I, I have to do it in a way that reflects the glory of God in my life. And just name the topic. The same is true with our money and our wealth. The same is true with comfort and convenience. And we could just go down the list and, and eventually we come to the, how, how, how do my politics reflect that Christ is the Lord of my life? How do my politics reflect me looking for the expressions of God's rule on this earth and How to go about living life in his righteousness, by his definitions, not not mine or not my party's. How how do I go about conducting myself in the realm of politics in a way that, that I do it for the glory of God, not the glory of myself, but the glory of God? Does does that make sense? Okay, so here's what we're gonna here's what we're gonna tackle today. You guys ready? Yeah. Everybody still in a good mood? <laughs> so if we're going to live our lives and allow the scriptures to influence our politics, then how does a Christian vote? And even more importantly, how does a Christian treat people who vote differently than they do? Now, we, we, could, we could talk about 12 other topics. But if I can get through these two today, we'll be, we'll be doing good. Folks, I, I want you to understand that from my understanding of what it is to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ, then verses like this ought to inform how we conduct ourselves politically. And that comes down to real things like our vote, and how we treat other people who vote differently than us. So let's, let's talk about how does a Christian vote. <laughs> what is a vote? A vote 
A vote is an expression of your beliefs. And this isn't just your religious beliefs. This could be your historical beliefs. This could be your beliefs about the things that really matter in life. Your vote, my vote, is the one chance I have in the nature of our government to cast something that represents what I believe in. And what I value, what I think is fundamentally important to life. The freedoms, the rights, the integrity of how I believe a nation should behave. And our vote is an expression of the things that we think are most important. The things we're passionate about. Things like education, things like children, things like morality and ethics. Our vote is the opportunity to express something about what we believe deeply, what we value deeply, and what we think are highest priorities. Other people may have different beliefs, and they may have different values, and may have different priorities. And guess what? They get to cast their vote. Can we be really honest right now? He didn't tell me. <laughs> if your vote is cast in allegiance to a candidate, a party, a platform, or any number of other social reasons other than to glorify God, then Jesus is not seated on the throne in your heart. You know, I don't have this all figured out. I've spent the last 15 years sort of watching this with great curiosity, having a lot of conversations, reading a lot, doing a lot of research. And I found that there's a lot of different reasons why people vote and how they vote. And I don't think everybody's being quite as honest as they need to be. Here's why people vote. Some people, they vote for party because they are loyal Republicans. They are loyal Democrats. They, they vote for their party's platform. They, they believe in some of the things that that party represents. And, and that's fine. But you have to be honest to something. Has your party or your platform changed at all in the last 50 years? Or have you changed it all as a Christ follower in the last 50 years? And historically, the facts are in. Both Republican and Democratic parties have changed in the last 50 years to where they're almost unrecognizable to what they used to be. That's why you hear things, well, this isn't the Reagan party anymore. Well, this is nothing like John F. Kennedy would have believed in or espoused why because parties change and a christian has to act ask is has my party and its platform changed in a way that is now really inconsistent with my beliefs as a christian and a follower of jesus some people they're just loyal to a candidate not necessarily understanding if the candidate is capable of doing the job of a president the president isn't your pastor he's not your she's not your spiritual shepherd shouldn't be they have one job they have the job to do as a president are they capable of that that's that, that's those are honest questions some people they vote family i come from a long line of democrats I, I come from a long line of Republicans. What, 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 listen to what people say. They say, my grandfather would roll over in his grave if he knew I was voting for the other team. I think my mom would disown me if she found out I voted for X. What is that? Be honest with it. It's not because of the lordship of Christ. What you're saying is, my grandfather or my mother sits on the throne and calls the shot of how I'm going to vote. All my friends are this. All my friends are that. So I just sort of go with the flow. Some people, this is big right now. Race, uh, race gender, and age. 
I don't care who becomes a president as long as it's not an old white guy. That, that's the language we're using. It isn't anything about Christ. It's about a race or a gender or an age. And, and you just explore all these. Here's one. This, this one's really important. And people aren't honest to it. Finances. I know some people. They vote a particular way because the industry that they're in and the work that they do prospers under a certain kind of administration. And they vote a particular way because they know if that party assumes power, that they're looking at four years, maybe eight years of tremendous prosperity. And so the truth of the matter is that I've put my money and wealth on this throne rather than, in fact, what Jesus Christ would have me support. Does that make sense? Lordship is about allegiance. Lordship is about who sets the agenda or calls the shot in my life. You ready? For a Christian... Their one vote ought to align with those beliefs, those values, and those priorities that reflect the place of Christ in their life. Uh, is, do you get that? <laughs> I have not said right or left, blue or red. Republican or Democrat, I'm just saying, for a Christ follower, this one vote ought to reflect the beliefs, the values, and the priorities that Christ has called me to. If, in fact, I'm going to say he's the king of my life. You say, well, Paul, that's not very easy. I know. It's just not that clear cut. I know. While there are not specific instructions in the Bible about how one ought to vote. You don't find the United States of America in the Bible. There's not a single example in the Bible of a constitutional republic. Where its citizens have rights and freedoms and a voice. There's no pictures of that in the Bible. So we're left at taking the truths of the scriptures and drawing out principles that would apply to the very real situations that we live in. There's not specific instructions in the Bible about how one ought to vote. But voting would be no different than any other activity in a Christian's life. It is to be consistent with the clear teachings of God's word as we can best discern through a study of the scriptures and the leading of the Holy Spirit in our life. But most Christians I've ever talked to, they don't pray about how they cast their vote. But if Christ is the ruler of our life, we ought to be deeply in prayer about it. Asking for the spirit of God to direct us about the best way to express our beliefs, our values, and our priorities as followers of Jesus Christ. And, and I believe there, there are many principles of scripture that come to bear on all the political, social, moral issues of contemporary society. You know, I've said it before. I'll keep saying it. I hope someday people will embrace the spirit in which I say it. All of the hot social topics of our day, name them. They're, they're not political. They've been politicized, but they are not political. You see, all of those hot social issues of our day, they're moral and ethical at our roots. And... If they're moral and ethical, then they're founded in spiritual truths. And here's what's happened. 
seeing the hot social issues of our day as only political and refusing to talk about them in spiritual context is exactly why they've all been politically hijacked. In fact, insisting that they are only political and that they shouldn't be discussed in the church or by Christians is just a way of bullying the church into silence about them, leaving Christians uneducated on exactly what is at stake when we don't speak up and stand up against that which threatens the welfare of our children, our families, our livelihood, our freedoms as citizens of the country that we live in. So you say, are you going to tell me how to vote? Yeah, I'm going to tell you right now. You ready? You ready? I wonder who just got most nervous. <laughs> Recognizing there is no perfect party, no ideal candidate. A Christian is wise. It's not black and white. It's so gray. And you have to use a discerning spirit that's guided by the truth of the scriptures and the indwelling Holy Spirit. A a Christian is wise to cast their vote for the administration that is most likely to honor such principles and preserve the rights that protect a Christian's freedom, safety, and influence as an American citizen. And how you figure that out is up to you but be honest about it be honest about it do the work understand your vote from the best biblical theological Christ honoring perspective as you can come up with it's not a perfect system But it's really, really important. You good? There's one person in the room. I just know they're so nervous. For me, they're like, oh, what's he going to say? All right. Next question, how does a Christian treat people who vote differently than they do? And I think this is even more important than the last conversation we just had. There's only one answer. And you can't genuinely be interested in following Jesus and arrive at any other conclusion. What we're talking about is the way of Jesus. And it is to be the way of those who follow Jesus. And that is the way of love. I mean, Jesus made it clear. I'm giving you a new command. These are the new marching orders. We're no longer under the law with 630 different commands. No, we're just going to focus on the one. And the one is this. Love one another. Love each other. Love people. And then, just to clarify how, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, people will come to know that you're my disciples, and that is if you love. How we love others is the most compelling and convincing argument of the witness of Jesus Christ. And and Christians haven't done this well. And some of the reason why we haven't done this well is because it's been implied it shouldn't be talked about at church. You know, you watch the news, you follow social media, you work with people, you know that this has become a very contentious um, dimension of our nation. And yes, this language in this next verse would be appropriate. 
You have heard it said, Jesus, Jesus said, you have heard, you've heard your rabbi say, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Rabbis were teaching the permission to hate people that you didn't agree with or you didn't get along with. But I'm telling you, Jesus says, you're going to be one of my followers. I want you to love that person that you hold with such angry feelings. I want you to love your enemies and pray for those. Pray for those who are aligned against you. That that you may be the children of your father in heaven. In other words, act like Christ followers. Now, real quick, does loving people like Christ commands, does that mean accepting and adopting and applauding and approving of lifestyle choices and other social um, moral issues that are in fact immoral or dangerous or empty of common sense? Does that mean I, I just have to let everything go? No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that how you treat other people who embrace beliefs and values and priorities that are different than yours, they must be treated with love. What does love look like? It looks like it's patient. It's kind. It, it doesn't envy. It, it doesn't bo uh, boast. It, it's not arrogant or proud. Oh boy, Christians have done this poorly. It doesn't dishonor others. We've done that poorly. It's not self-seeking. We, we've done that poorly. It is not easily angered. We've done that really, really poorly. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. All right. I'm almost out of time. Some would say you are. <laughs> so we're going to get really practical here. and We're going to move very quickly. You want to get really practical? Right or left, I don't care. When you distort the truth, you misrepresent the facts, you cherry pick the research, you misquote the author or manipulate the science to attack your opponent or promote your agenda, Christ is not seated on the throne of your heart because you're being dishonest. And if Christ sits on the throne, he insists that you be honest. Right or left, if you're sitting at your computer being a keyboard warrior, lambasting your political adversaries with your party rhetoric, your snarky memes, your partisan stats and statistics, Christ is not seated on the throne in your heart because you're being unkind. Right or left, when you adopt attitudes or behaviors... That God clearly disproves of for the sake of your political preference. Christ is not seated on the throne of your heart. You're being disobedient. Right or left. When you mock. When you demean. You ignore. You label or lose your temper to attack your opponent. Or promote your argument. Christ is not seated on the throne of your heart. You're being arrogant. Last one. Right or left, if your face is turning red, your veins are popping out of your neck, spitballs are flying from your mouth, or your voice is full of rage, Christ is not seated on the throne of your heart. You are out of control. Folks, the person that you disagree with politically is not your adversary. They're not your enemy. They're not your opponent or a threat to your way of life. They are human beings. They're in need of the same grace, the same mercy, the same forgiveness, the same love, compassion, and understanding that you are in need of. They're certainly not less deserving of it than you are. 
over and over and over again, Jesus makes it very clear. We are to love others like Christ loved us. And I can assure you, he does not always agree with our beliefs, our values, or our priorities. As Christ followers, you are both called and commanded to love others, even if they hold different political viewpoints. Not love them as in tolerate them with a grouchy reluctance, but to truly love them, to seek their very best for them as ambassadors of Jesus in their life. That is how Christians are to live. There's more, but we got to go. I'll say this. You ready? Come November, when all the votes have been tabulated and a candidate has been chosen. If you're living in fear and anger because of the results... I'd suggest that Christ is not seated on the throne of your heart. He's either the Lord of all who reigns or he's not. But if you're going to run around professing that he's the Lord of your life, then I'd say live like that. Live like that. Make sense? Stand together. At the risk of being weird, would you take the hand of the person seated next to you? You know, that's Republicans and Democrats. (laughs) That's black and white. That's conservatives and liberals. But under Christ, we are one. And the strength of the church and its witness in the world is this. God, we bravely come to these topics under the truth of your word and the guidance of your spirit with the hope of of finding a discernment about how we should choose and how we should behave as your people on this earth. Help us to live like Christ does in fact sit on the throne of our heart. I pray and ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you everybody. Have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday.